Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to another episode on the New Books Network. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Miranda Melcher, and I'm very pleased to have with me today Stephen Robert Miller to tell us all about his just published book titled Over the Seawall, Tsunamis, Cyclones, Drought, and the Delusion of Controlling Nature. This is a fascinating book that really focuses on that last bit, the delusion of controlling nature, to take us through some instances where humanity has built some things that thought they were controlling nature, but actually had some pretty not great unintended consequences, um, both in the short and, as Stephen demonstrates in the book, in the longer term as well. This book, I think, is going to be interesting to people who want to understand why things happened, but also looking ahead as well. So Stephen, thank you so much for joining us to tell us all about your book. Thanks for having me, Miranda. Before we get into all of the maladaptions discussed in the text, would you mind introducing yourself a bit and explaining why you decided to write this? Of course. Um, So I'm an environmental journalist, and I've been working in that field for um, more than a decade now. Um, And I kept coming across these stories, small stories often, especially in the Intermountain West of the United States, Um, stories of people who had tried to kind of remake their land in a way to make their jobs easier, often farming. And then down the road realized that their efforts to remake the land had caused all these downstream uh, negative impacts. Um, And then they were having to deal with the burdens of trying to undo all those previous mistakes, those previous decisions to try to remake the land. Um, And then on top of that, you had climate change that was changing the way the land was actually working around them. And I kept I kept coming across this over and over again and um, started to feel like it was a it was a deeper thread than just the individual stories. Um, so I grew up in southern Arizona, in the middle of the desert, not far from the uh, the border with Mexico. And I had always found it kind of strange that there were so many people moving to this part of the United States. I mean, it's one of the fastest growing areas in the country. Um, and yet it's so blisteringly hot. Um, and every day you're hearing issues about, you know, the water shortages on the Colorado River, which feeds that area. Um, and I started to wonder why those people were coming there. And over years, I started to recognize the kind of, there, there was a connection between those earlier stories I had written with uh, people remaking the land uh, to their own benefit and to that question that I had kind of grown up with, which is why are these people here and is this going to last? Um, and that eventually got me into this idea of maladaptation. And next thing I know, I was down that rabbit hole into a world of research uh, and inter- international travel that ultimately became this book. So given that backstory, um, I think listeners are not going to be surprised that one of the three places you focus on is, in fact, Arizona. Um, But you look at two others as well. Given how many examples I'm sure you found down that rabbit hole, uh, can you tell us first kind of what the other two are and explain how you decided which to focus on? Yes, uh, there were so many examples, um, and I really decided I wanted to narrow it down to three, partly because... um, I was modeling this book in a way after John McPhee's The Control of Nature, which also focuses on three stories across, around the world, most two of them in the U.S. and one out in Scandinavia, um, with a similar kind of thread. Um, so I, Arizona was always going to be there. Um, the, the story in Bangladesh actually happened. Um, I was doing a fellowship at the University of Colorado, Boulder, uh, the Ted Scripps Fellowship in Environmental Journalism. And while I was there, I audited a course um, – by a woman who was talking about um, environmental ethics. And she had done a lot of work in Bangladesh, uh, especially looking at uh, villages and their, the way that they manage their communal water supplies and, and um, you know, common pool resources. Uh, and at some point I asked her, you know, if you ever go to Bangladesh again in the near future and you have room to bring a journalist along, let me know. And it just so happened that she was going that summer after our class. And so I tagged along with her. And when I was there, I learned all about the embankments and it started to be kind of like this idea was really coalescing there in Bangladesh because you really see the impacts of, of maladaptation in a way that I don't think you can see quite as obviously in many other places in the world as something that's been happening there for centuries and widespread impacts. And you can see the people really dealing with the impacts of this today uh, in a way that, you know, uh, is tragically apparent. Um, it was when I got back to the States, went back into my research, and I started digging into maladaptation and kind of the more academic side of it. I came across uh, research on the, uh, the tsunami in 2011 in Japan and specifically came across researchers who were looking at the maladaptive 
uh, aspects of the seawalls that were built before and after the tsunami. And that for me was the real moment where the whole thing, that was a light bulb moment. That was a moment where all, it all uh, finally clicked and I understood kind of what I was looking at. And so when I put the book together, I decided I was obviously going to write about Arizona because it's the one is where I come from. Uh, the Bangladesh example was, I think, one of the largest and uh, most important examples out there. And I think that the Japanese example for me was the, the the story in a nutshell. And since it helped me understand this kind of wonky and big idea, I figured it would also help readers to understand it. So that's why I start with with Japan. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for taking us through your sort of behind the scenes thinking, as it were, to get to this point. Given the differences between the three cases you examine, I was really fascinated to read that while kind of how these things got put into place was quite different, what the strategies were, the problems they were trying to solve, what happened, were all different. And yet there were some kind of common justifications, some common threads for why these strategies were put into place um, in the first place. Can you take us through what some of those similar thinkings almost were? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, eh, one of the most obvious, I think, um, and the most cynical uh, is arrogance in a big way. Um, so many of these schemes were put into place by people who really believed that they knew how to control nature, that they that they knew how to, con- to remake the land, to make it do what they wanted it to do for their own personal gains. Uh, which brings us to another big one, which um, is the exploitation of capital and resource. Uh, it's a, it a big part of why these things were built in Bangladesh. Uh, the levees were largely put in place to help uh, facilitate uh, agriculture and to drive increased yields to, so they could grow more, more, have more seasons of growing throughout the year on more land. Um, this is an incredibly active, dynamic delta floodplain um, and trying to keep it dry so that they could grow f- a food often for export and, and other things like jute. Um, for, for export back to, to Britain, especially, um, was a, it was a very costly and disastrous decision. Um, in Arizona, you know, it's, it's about trying to build these massive cities into trying to, I mean, the, the Bureau of Reclamation in the U.S. is called Reclamation. Like, what are they reclaiming? This is kind of an old trope in this field, but it's true. It's, um, you're talking about reclaiming a desert and making it wet again, I guess, is the idea there, if you want to be literal with the word. Um, but obviously, a desert has always been a desert as long as it's been a desert and it's always been dry. Um, and so the idea that man could come in and, and reclaim it and make it wet is, is just you know, a, a show of arrogance and also an attempt, again, to, to wring some more profit out of the landscape, uh, no matter what the downstream effects are going to be. Those are two of the biggest ones, I think. And surprisingly common, um, even though the circumstances of each of the cases is so different. Given that kind of reasoning and keeping that similarity in mind, I'd love to ask you a bit about each of the three cases in a bit more detail. Um, We know with Japan how badly things failed with the earthquake, the tsunami, the nuclear reactor. Um, But I think perhaps because of the significance of the failure, we sometimes forget kind of just how many preparations were in place to try and prevent it. Can you take us through what the prevention methods were before 2011 and explain kind of how and why they failed so badly? Sure. And I mean, it's it's tricky with this one, especially because um, it's hard to say that the walls uh, in 2011 just blatantly failed because the reality is that they had never been built to withstand this kind of a wave. Um, uh, the Japanese engineers and scientists and the, and the politicians who built them just never really had a wave at that height uh, in mind for these for these walls. So there were walls all up and down the coast, lots of seawalls, uh, breakers, levees on rivers. Um, there were they were intended for a wave at a much smaller, uh, height and uh, one of the one of the really tragic things that happened is I think it was 1960 there was the great Chilean earthquake which was huge, uh, huge earthquake happened across the ocean. By the time it reached uh, Japan, its height was exactly about as high uh, as needed to be to be withstood by the walls that were in place. And so for a lot of the for the Japanese people at the time, it was kind of proof that these walls that they had built were going to withstand a, a giant earthquake and they were enough. They had no idea what was going to come in 2011. Although they had reason that they, they might have, they, or they, <clears throat> they had no idea what was going to come in 2011. Although they had 
plenty of opportunities to have to have been aware of it, the possibility of it. Um, so yeah, so there was there's seawalls, there's breakers, embankments on the rivers, uh, breakers out in, in the bays. They had a an, an advanced system of early warning. Uh, SNET out in the ocean would tell them when there was a wave, when there was an earthquake, how quickly it was coming. Uh, give uh, pretty quick. Um, feedback back on land people to tell them you know whether they should be evacuating and that was also one of the big one of the most tragic aspects of this is their early uh predictions of the wave height were much lower than the actual wave ended up being and so many people decided not to flee and the thing that i really cling to in the book is many of them chose not to flee because of these walls and that was a maladaptive aspect of the walls was that they People were staying in the shadows of these walls, sometimes standing on top of these walls while the wave was coming in, taking photos and videos and things, um, really believing wholeheartedly that the walls the government had built that had protected them in, the, in 1960 uh, were going to stand strong against this particular wave. And of course, that was not the case. Um, but you know, the other aspect was that the predictions of the wave fight were so much smaller than the wave actually ended up being that uh, people thought that they were going to be okay. And the and um, but beyond the physical aspects of that, between with beyond SNET and the walls and the breakers, there was also, of course, um, uh, lots of training for people. Uh, Japanese people had grown up um, learning how to evacuate and where to go for safe spaces. Um, unfortunately, many of them, many of the spaces that had been designated as safe spaces, turned out to be within the the, the flood zone uh, and were washed away. And so, people, some people did everything right and still died. Um, and it's hard to just say that that was a total failure on the behalf of the you know, Japanese government or something. I don't think that would be fair. I think the reality was that this disaster was just on a scale that nobody could see coming. Mm. That makes sense. Um, and I think highlights the issue of the futility of controlling nature, right? We don't have enough information to do that. We don't know what's going to happen next. And that goes back to your point about arrogance of maybe assuming that we do um, and creating things that don't quite work for that. Absolutely. Given what you've just described for us, and of course, there's far more detail in the book for people who really want to get into this case. I was honestly quite surprised to read that in response to this, Japan is doubling down on sea wells is is building higher ones um that seems a little bit strange to me i suppose uh understanding what i do from reading the book about kind of what went wrong can you explain why uh this is being continued as a method and to what extent there are sort of questions and pushback about it that's something that really drew me as I started looking into this. You know, I started this book thinking about writing about concrete and steel and computer programs and things. But the more I got into it, the more I was really fascinated by the human stories behind these big pieces of techno infrastructure. Um, and, you know, the, the human aspect of having to live through that disaster in Japan and then seeing the walls there that were there fail and then the response afterward. And this is an incredibly complex issue. Um, I interviewed dozens and dozens of people on this and to try to understand, you know, why are these walls being built? The, the walls that are being built now are much, much higher than the ones that were there that failed in 2011. They're enormous. Um, you know, I've not spent a lot of time in Japan and researching for this book. I was really taken aback by how much of the coast is armored in this white and light gray concrete. Um, you know, it looks like the walls of a castle in places. And some of these rivers are so covered in concrete that they don't even resemble rivers anymore. They just look like canals. Um, but, you know, a few years ago, they were, in many cases, actually free-flowing, you know, natural-appearing rivers. Um, part of the reason that they're doing this is because they have to do something. I mean, you can't watch 20,000 of your people die um, and then not have a strong response. And so armoring the coast uh, at first, especially, was really looked at as something that was absolutely necessary. <clears throat> and it was proof that the government was taking care of its people in a way. Um, I heard that from lots of folks that I interviewed that the, at, the, at, the, at the outset, immediately after the wave, there was pretty great support for uh, newer and higher walls. <clears throat> but then as the conversations around the walls started to, to go on, 
it became clear that people weren't really sure they actually really wanted to live behind these massive pieces of infrastructure, these huge hulking pieces of concrete. Um, you know, some of these places you walk behind the wall, you have no idea uh, where the ocean is. And these up in the northeast in Tohoku, these are fishing communities where generations of people have relied on the sea for their livelihoods. They play, obviously, you know, a, a crucial role in culture and uh, religion. And to just have this piece of metal and concrete sever that link uh, was really uh, was devastating for a lot of people, not just for the economic aspects, people in tourism complain about it, right? Because who would want to drive all the way up to Tohoku or take the train up from, from Tokyo or Kyoto or something just to look at a hulking piece of concrete. Um, but also the psychological aspect of living behind the walls. Um, <clears throat> and then on top of it all, the reality is that these walls are not big enough to stop a 2011 size wave. Um, and everybody knows that. Uh, it was, they're not intended to be again. The idea is that these walls will buy time for evacuation, um, in places that were really hit hard. The towns have also been either elevated or moved back places, uh, that were destroyed or are not, no longer developed residentially. And so some people, the complaint is that, well, if you've moved our town away from the coast, why do we still have to have a wall? Because we're not living down there anymore. So now you've you've moved us and destroyed our landscape and our view of the sea and our connection with the ocean. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, at the end of the day, something had to be done. And so the, the walls are just one part of many things that are being done, like moving and increasing uh, education around evacuation, raising the towns up. Um, there are natural fortifications in many places, uh, big, huge, thick forests uh, um, that are designed to help insulate or at least you know kind of buffer a little bit. Um, but the walls are certainly a big part of the reaction. And I mean, it's hard to be there and not think that in a large way, they are a, um, a symbolic gesture almost toward, you know, the sense that we can withstand what the sea throws at us. Hmm. Symbolic gestures in the face of massive waves. That's right. That's Interesting right. methodology there. Yeah. But- <clears throat> As you said, something had to be done. So an interesting thing to keep in mind, I think, um, thinking about reactions to bad things happening, right? Death and destruction. That's right. Moving to Bangladesh, um, in this particular case, as you briefly mentioned at the beginning, the embankments and levees to try and make productive use of the river delta um, is not a new thing not like the seawalls necessarily. I mean, this really goes back much longer than I had quite realized. Um, And yet they keep failing. Um, This isn't a one-time thing. This is a really quite incredibly common problem, which seems a bit strange given just how long long the work has been going on to do this and the amount of data available. Why do the embankments and levees keep failing? A crucial aspect of maladaptation is the idea of technological lock-in, right? That you start doing something at one point, you build up systems, uh, infrastructure, economic, political systems uh, for this way of handling uh, a hazard. And it basically just becomes easier to continue to do that thing than it does to do anything else because you're, you know, you're, you're sinking, you're constantly sinking the cost into it. Changing at some point, you know, is, can be very costly. Uh, you'd have to totally start over and rethink uh, how to manage these things. So uh, I think a part of the reason this embankments are, have been built for so long in Bangladesh is largely because um, it was the earliest way that people thought about dealing with it. And they just kind of kept doing it because it was the easiest way, in a sense, um, to just keep doing what they were, what they had always done. If the waves kept coming or the, sorry, if the uh, if the floods keep coming then we'll just build taller embankments. And then when they break down, we'll just rebuild them. Um, it's a, it's an incredible part of the world. You know, this place is built up, I think it's about on 12 kilometers of, of mud and silt that has been washed off the Himalaya mountains and the plain um, and has just fanned out. And that is what Bangladesh is. It's sitting on top of this huge fan of, of mud and silt. Um, so it's an incredibly dynamic aspect that is changing constantly. There are more than 200 rivers. I've seen it cited anywhere from 230 to 900 rivers, you know, so clearly people are not quite sure how many rivers there are really. Um, that's often because they're moving and they're changing and their water courses, they're joining each other, they're breaking apart and creating new, new streams. 
and because of the substrate that they're built into, the mud plane is uh, so you know malleable. Um, and so it seems like the, the obvious, the cheapest way also is to build earthen embankments. Um, you know, when I was there, I spoke with many people who were actively working on building or rebuilding embankments. Um, one man I talked to, uh, and he was in the process of you know carrying mud up the slope and slapping it together with his bare hands into a into an embankment. Um, uh, he had said he had done it. I think he had said it was three times previously. He had built that same wall, and he pointed out toward the the river. Um, and you could kind of see some tops of trees sticking up. And I think at one point there was even like a pole that might've held electrical lines or something. And he had, you know, said that's, you know, that's where the, the edge of the river used to be. That's where the bank had used to be. And now we were so much farther in. We were, you know, yards and yards inland. And he was again, rebuilding the same embankment. Um, so it's almost like a habit, you know, you just kind of start doing a thing and just keep it going. But a habit with some pretty, bad human costs, right? The idea of your house going underwater and having to rebuild again on very precarious footing. Why does this keep being the habit? I mean, that's a good question. Um, From my perspective on it, it's largely because the people who are, who, you know, years ago, the people who really established this idea uh, were foreigners who didn't have to live with the consequences of it and their day-to-day life. There were plenty of people through the ages, through the years, um, who warned against the risks of embanking these rivers, right? The issue is that you embank these rivers, that sediment load um, will build up in the river rather than being allowed to spill over the plain. That's how the the Deltaic Plain in Bangladesh became to be, is these rivers would flood and they would distribute that sediment. That's also why the the Delta is such a rich agricultural area, is because that sediment is is nutrient-rich soil. when you bank the rivers, you keep them from flooding. The silt builds up inside the river. Um, that means the water level inside the river actually rises. And so at the same time, on the other side of the embankment, the land, right, that used to get seasonal deposition of, of sediment is, is compacting. And so that land is actively sinking. So you have the twofold impact of the water in the rivers rising and the, and the land on the either side of it falling. And so when you have a big storm surge out in the bay or you have a big monsoon upriver, um, the, those embankments give way. And I mean, there are places where I'm walking around Bangladesh and the land on my right is lower than the water on my left in the river. And so you know that when the, when the embankment gives way, that land is going to be totally inundated and the people living there are going to be washed away. And that happens over and over again. Um, the people who live there and have lived there for a long time are aware of this, but these bankments, you know, they were a Dutch idea. They came from the Netherlands. Uh, the polder came out of the Netherlands. Um, and it was seen as it works in the Netherlands. It'll clearly work here. Of course, the obvious difference is between the Netherlands geography, the Netherlands and geography of Bangladesh had never really been fully considered because if they had, people would have recognized that, you know, the rivers and and the Dutch are trying to claim land from the ocean. Uh, they're not dealing with these rivers that are carrying this enormous sediment load to, to, to the bay, the way Bangladesh is. It's a completely different hydrological system. So they just tried to impose a solution onto a place where the solution really didn't you know, belong. Um, and of course, the funding. You know, you're getting funding from out-of-state uh, foreign investors and aid agencies. And um, early on, you get, this is being paid for by colonists who are hoping to wrench, like I said, you know, resources that drive agricultural uh, yield and, and get resources out of here. And so outside funding wasn't particularly interested in the long-term impacts of this thing. They were thinking more about short-term profit. Unfortunate, and yet a number of similarities in the third case, um, going right back to your roots in Arizona. Um, in some ways, a similar sort of story of decisions made a long time ago that create conditions we're still very much living with, even if that's not entirely what they intended. Can you take us through some key decisions made by a very small number of people in the 1920s um, that we're still grappling with today in Arizona? Right. We just passed the centennial anniversary of the the Colorado Compact, which was um, a way that uh, American leaders, mostly agricultural leaders, got together and politicians got together to try to 
determine how to manage the water in the Colorado River for all the states um, that depended on it. Today, there's something like 40 million people who depend on this water <clears throat> spread out across seven states and also Mexico, as well as all the ecosystems, habitats that need you know the water in that system. Um, back in the 20s, they were dealing with uh, already several decades of growth in this region, agricultural growth especially, um, and the realization that there just wasn't a lot of uh, there wasn't a lot of surface water to support it all. And so they knew they were going to have to find a larger source. The Colorado River uh, was the obvious source for that water. And at the time, it seemed like it was pretty big. Um, you know, I go into much more detail on this in the book. And this is also a very complicated issue, the way the, the Arizona or sorry, Western water law, American Western water law is a dense topic. Um, but the short of it is that these guys got together and in an effort to make it seem as though their ambitions for growing the West were feasible, um, they, they determined that there was more water in the river than there actually was. And what they did then is to write up a compact that gave all of the states a certain amount of water that they were allowed to take out of the river. So they committed the region to generations of thinking that there was going to be a certain amount of water uh, for them which means they could use that to plan the cities that they were going to grow and, and the way that they were going to farm. And in reality, there was much, uh, much less water than they actually, than they said there was in the contract. Um, um, I'm trying to think now there's a book. There's a great book. I don't remember the name of it. My brain just passed on it. Good thing <laughs> to cut all this stuff out. Um, no oh, worries. Yeah. So uh, there's an excellent book uh, called Science Be Damned that gets really into the nuances of this stuff. Um, but they dispel in that the authors dispel the the long held myth that they're that they had just that this contract was determined at a period when this is a particularly wet period. The idea had always been that, well, they, they had all these sensors and gauges out there. They were measuring the flow of the river and they thought that there was more water than there was because they happened to be measuring it at a time that we just had a lot more rain and there was a lot more water in the river. That's partially true, but really what's true as they, as this book is, describes in detail is that, um, the men just exaggerated the amount of water in the river because they wanted to make sure there was going to be enough support for their big infrastructure projects that were going to support, um, the development that they wanted to bring to the area because there was just so much money and still today is so much money to be made off of water in the desert. Staying on that topic, um, you talk in the book, you have this great uh, quote, I think from a local writer in Arizona that talks about the cap and it being like, quote, giving a case of whiskey to an alcoholic. Um, obviously, in what you've described already, there is that kind of emphasis of uh, money, money, money really being a driving force here. Is there anything further you can tell us about this aspect of it? Well, that was Charles Bowden. He was a writer. Um... He lived right down the street from me, actually, when I was in, still living in Tucson for a time. He, he, he died now, but um, he's dead now, but he lived down the street from me for a time when I was in Tucson. It's almost sacrilege to say that the cap is maladaptive. Um, you know, without the Central Arizona Project, you wouldn't have Phoenix or Tucson. Um, maybe not at all, but certainly not in the way that we think about them. Um, but to build it, you know, people took, Euro-Americans Euro took blatant advantage of the Navajo people and other tribal groups, which they had been doing for years. Of course, this is not the only instance of that. Um, but um, it's a, it, at the time, it was the largest infrastructure project in, I think, in American history. It was a huge undertaking. Um, it seemed impossible. You had to pipe water uphill over hundreds of miles. Um, but they pulled it off. And to say now that that was, you know, that was a problem problematic decision it's almost like you're trying to really rewrite history like revisionist history in that sense because in arizona this is looked at as like it, well we wouldn't be here if it wouldn't if that wasn't a thing what would happen if you just take it away um but the reality is it's also allowed for the 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 you know what i consider to be unsustainable growth that's happening in the desert both agricultural and you know human <clears throat> development residential and, and industry wise Bringing the cap in at the time, the farmers were hot, and at the time the farmers were entirely dependent on groundwater, and they had just about tapped that. The land was subsiding underneath them because they were sucking so much of the water out of the ground, um, and so I mean, it was pretty much 
like farming was going out in this region. There was there wasn't a lot of hope unless they had some sort of a way to get more water in from outside the the, the local streams and rivers and groundwater supply. And so the cap saved agriculture in the region. And you look at kind of the downturn impact, the downstream impacts of that today. And of course, agriculture today uses about three quarters of the water in the entire region. Um, there's a lot of people who argue that we shouldn't be growing uh, food or anything in the desert, but especially in, uh, not uh, like hay and cotton. Um, but all of this was made possible by the cap. And the reason that some of the farmers were growing hay and still grow hay and cotton is largely because of the cap, because there was a a huge debt that was incurred for the construction of the cap. And you can't grow heirloom tomatoes and pay off a debt. You have to grow a crop that is going to sell uh, a, a, you know, a large quantity, is going to sell at a good price at a, at a big market. And that kept that kind of locked the farmers into growing things like cotton and hay. And therefore perpetuating um, these problematic decisions. And again, the whiskey and the alcoholic. Um, Obviously, a lot of the people reading this book and listening to this interview uh, can probably readily see the problems in the solutions that you are describing, um, but may not be in a position to necessarily make these policy changes themselves. Is there anything you'd like readers to take away regardless of whether they can actually you know, decide not to put in seawalls or come up with different methods uh, for controlling river deltas? Is there anything even more sort of every day that you want people to look at differently? Yes. I mean, the thing that I really want people to do when they read this book is to recognize when these decisions are happening at home. I think this is an idea that is um, perhaps a bit wonky uh, and academic. It's And it might be hard for the everyday average, you know, layman to, to kind of wrap their minds around some of this stuff and the long-term implications of it and the long histories of these things. And I, I wanted people to be able to see when, um, their own decisions to maybe build, um, a seawall, you know, in their, in their, on their properties and like on the California coast might be problematic or if they, they come across you know, in, in their city, uh, whether it's New York city or Miami or, um, somewhere else in the world, uh, they, they see plans to build a giant, seawall or to embank a river, they might stop and think, um, well, maybe perhaps this is not the best way to do it. And they might show up to a council meeting and, and, and have be armed with the information and the kind of the long-term outlook to say that we need to consider the downstream impacts of this thing before we commit to it. One of the big, big things that an individual can do that has nothing to do with, you know, infrastructure, uh, is just about the choice of where we live. And this is a really tough and tricky thing to talk about because, it's hard to, you know, tell people that they just shouldn't live in a place. You know, if I go into Phoenix and say, geez, you guys probably shouldn't be living here. Um, you know, you get laughed out because it's, first of all, they are living there. We expect everyone just to pick up and leave. And where are they going to go, right? Is everyone going to move to Detroit or something? Um, because the impacts of climate change are expected to be lesser there. Um, it, but the reality is that we're facing a problem now that is so much bigger. This is like the wave thing in, in Japan, right? We're, we're facing a problem now that is so much greater than we can really even fathom at this point. And so we that requires us to think of things in a different way. And my big argument with this book, right, is you cannot solve this problem using the same thinking you used to cause the problem. And so if we're still going around thinking that we can solve climate change or we can protect ourselves from climate change uh, with, you know, techno infrastructure built in a capitalist system um, of economic exploitation uh, and just shoot and basically just running on the arrogance that says we can live wherever we want to live, however we want to live for as long as we want to, um, you know, we're going to fail and it's going to it's going to hurt. It won't hurt us. It'll hurt our next generation. It'll hurt our kids and our kids, kids the most. And so. I want people to think a little bit more holistically about all of this stuff uh, and to recognize that the choices they make now and the ways they live and the places that they live um, are going to have long-term impacts. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I imagine you mentioned at the beginning, you introduced yourself as an environmental journalist. Um, So I imagine that that's probably going to have something to do with your final answer. Um, The book is obviously available for people to read. Is there anything you might be working on now or next, whether or not it's on maladaptive um, structures, whether or not it's a book that you'd like to let our audience know about? Um, sure. I'm, I'm working on, uh, working, 
Sure. I'm working on a story right now, a feature for a magazine um, that's looking into uh, the use of fossil fuels to adapt, which seems kind of counterintuitive, but um, you know, all around the world, especially in uh, developing nations where the cost of adaptation is incredibly high, uh, people are having to lean on what they can in order to fund um, uh, adaptation efforts. And in many cases, um, they don't have the money to build renewable energy and the time it's going to take to get enough renewables up to scale uh, is just not fast enough, especially in places like Bangladesh and India and um, where in all across Africa where people are looking to develop quickly just to increase their quality of life. Um, and so they're leaning on the same thing that Western nations leaned on years ago, of course, which is fossil fuels. And so there's a fascinating conflict there. And I'm, I'm kind of trying to parse that out. Hmm. Well, that will be quite interesting. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and of course, I'll still be um, looking into the maladaptation aspect as we go and hoping to just kind of keep an eye on it and alert people to it when I see it. I think you work on a book for years. I think this one took me four or five years and um, you learn so much in the process. I mean, it is a learning process. The reason why I love being a journalist is because I'm basically getting paid to learn. Um, and so uh, I, in the process of writing this book, I learned things I never thought about before. I was exposed to things I'd never been exposed to before. And now I want to apply all that knowledge and continue to apply it. So this book for me is almost like an introduction um, to this. And I hope to keep to keep walking down that path. Wonderful. Well, for any listeners who want to walk down it with you, um, the book is called Over the Seawall, Tsunamis, Cyclones, Drought and the Delusion of Controlling Nature uh, from Island Press, just published this year, I believe. Um, Stephen, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast. Miranda, thanks so much for having me.